Hello, welcome to the Hoop Collective Podcast. We talk about the NBA, which we're doing on Thursday afternoon. Joining me from New York City, we'll be for at least half of the next couple of weeks covering the 76ers Knicks series, Tim Bontemps. Two weeks in my own bed. Big winner of the playoffs is me so far. Well, there are games in Philly. You're going to have to go down there. All right, now we'll come back here and go to bed, just like I did after a Wednesday night's game. In between games three and four, you're going to come back home. Okay. Yes, you, you do. You do you on 95 there, brother. Join us from Dallas, Texas, where he's getting ready to go to L.A. this weekend for what I hope will be a great series between the Clippers and Mavericks. It's Tim Bunt. What an a- it's Ben McMahon. Howdy, partners. You just made Jackson do some extra work there, buddy. I know. I know. It's I hate when I do that, but uh, it's what happens when I got too much going through my head. Uh, OK. Uh, 76ers with a uh, gritty win over the Miami Heat. Uh, in the play-in on Wednesday night. Um, by the way, um, we have had four games so far in the playoffs. I know that the play-in doesn't technically count, but I count them as a playoff, so whatever. The we, have two star, we have two-star players already injured and probably not going to be able to play on Friday. We talked on the pod the other day about Zion with the hamstring. He's going to be out, not only if the Pelicans win at the beginning of you know the series with the potential thing with the thunder, but maybe even most of that series, if not all. And Jimmy Butler has, uh, you know, an odd injury going to the basket on a, on a breakaway uh, Wednesday night and looks to have an MCL injury. that's going to knock him out for a long period of time. Even if the heat get the win um, like last year over the, over the bulls and, you know, get a, a rematch with the Celtics. So it's just a rem- it's it stinks obviously, but it's a reminder as we begin to talk about the six series that are set as we will here in a second. It's a reminder of how injuries, no matter how much analysis that you do, no matter how much that you think a team may have something figured out or what advantage, that injuries are always, always, always a big factor in the playoffs and the transition from uh, regular season to postseason already has its own inherent changes. But sadly, as we start, we're already dealing with banged up players. And um, Bontemps, the team that you're going to be covering starting this weekend, starting Saturday in the Garden, injuries are a big factor in this series. One one team, the Sixers getting healthy, now moving to 32-8 and eight with Embiid in the starting lineup. And the Knicks, who will go into that game, obviously not whole, is the team that they have as they try to probably beat one of the most challenging number seven seeds as, ever, as, ever, as there's ever been in the history of the NBA playoffs. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like you should try all the way to the end of the regular season and get the highest seed you can. Uh, message to certain teams that maybe you shouldn't quit uh, in the second. Well, by the half way, wouldn't wouldn't games. this wouldn't the fact uh, that the that the Cavs doesn't this kind of undercut the fact that the Knicks have to play this team that's really good in seven? Doesn't this kind of back up what the Cavs? You can say that you disagree with no, it on a- no, no, it doesn't for two reasons. A, the Cavs locked themselves into maybe winning a round and having no chance to win a second one, and B, you have no idea what's going to happen from an injury standpoint or a, or a gameplay standpoint you have no idea if you take the if you take the pathetic way out that the Cavs did then sure you're telling well, you everyone what you think that, you are that you think it's a pathetic way out and you can make a strong point on that and I can agree with you but right now now as it turned out by the way the Cavs wouldn't have had the 2 seed they would have had the 3 if they won but the Cavs probably secretly they can't really say what they did because then it would undercut their declaration that it was the plan beforehand because that's what their defense was. It was the plan beforehand. Sure. Like, like if they beat the magic of the next round and like the Sixers beat the Knicks, they can't go, ha ha ha. We told you because allegedly to them, it didn't matter what happened in the fourth quarter of the other games. They had a plan. So they've put themselves in a corner, but don't you think that they could like privately argue like, this is what we were trying to avoid. We didn't want a 32 and eight. 76ers with then they should go they should start next season hanging a banner for winning a first round series however well, we're going to stop talking about the caps right. no no no, we're, no, 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 we're not because we're going to talk about the one thing that has been said in cleveland in the last uh few days that actually matters and that's donovan mitchell saying you're judged by conference finals and finals that's my mindset that's kind of where i'm at and where my head is at first round second round is cool I'm taking it one round at a time, but my goal is to make the conference finals and get to the NBA finals. You know what I mean? That's what I'm judged on. So the whole, ooh, the Cavs might fart their way out of the first round by manipulating the matchup. Guess what? The ultimate, the the big picture, (laughs) Donovan Mitchell is the big picture. 
And if Donovan Mitchell's saying, I don't give a crap about getting out of the first round if we can't, if we don't have a chance to get the conference finals, then. Yeah, he pretty much doubled down on, on your point, Von Temps. So I, I think, you know, I, I don't stand think. With, I, don't, I stand with Donovan Mitchell. Yeah, I'm just saying, though, that, there, that an argument against your, your position could be made. I'm not making that. The argument. only argument is if you have a loser mentality and you want to win one series, then right. they did the right thing. I don't well, anyway, the Knicks are getting the a very. Do. That's fine. Right. All right. The Knicks are Not getting a very quarter. challenging series for a two seed. Um, by the way, so are the Nuggets. The Lakers are a strong team for being a seven seed. That's for later on to discuss. Um, how do you? I, I didn't think Joel. If I was a if I was a seventy sixers fan, I Joel be a little skittish about fine. the way. Well, he didn't Joel look great. He finished. He, here's the thing. He finished here's strong. Thing. Yeah. Joel Embiid and the Sixers have a lot of trauma in the playoffs. Three years ago, 2021, they lose game seven at home to the Hawks in the second round. Two years ago, second round, game six, they lose to the Heat at home. Season ends. Last year, game six at home, chance to close Boston out, go to the conference finals. They fall apart in the final six minutes of the game in the fourth quarter. They lose game six. They go to Boston. They get smoked. That Their home arena in, in the playoffs has been a house of horrors. And that game last night, Wednesday night, was a game seven. You could see from the opening moment of the game, both of these teams knew what was at stake with a win and what was at stake with a loss. And they played like it the whole game. We have all been at a lot of game sevens. They are usually gross. They yes. Are competitive. Low scoring, they are awful. Yes. Low scoring, awful, physical, tense games the whole way through. And this was that to a T. The only mm. reason the Heat could score for most of the game is because the Sixers were literally just handing them the ball in the zone and giving them fast break, wide open layups over and over again. They had 17 points off turnovers in the first half. Sixers looked like a junior high team playing against the zone, just making crazy mistakes. And what you saw in the fourth quarter from Joel Embiid was a guy who finally said, I'm going to forget about everything else that's happened. And I'm just going to play the final seven minutes of the game and take over. And that's what he did. He started just playing like himself. He made a couple massive shots, made a huge pass to Kelly Uber out of a double team. One of the, a, obviously one a of the great pass, one of the big criticisms of Joel throughout his career is he's not handled those situations. Well, when he's been in a tight spot with the ball, makes a beautiful pass to Ubre for what was really the game winning basket. And the Sixers had to survive that game because that's well, they also that's, got the best game from Nick Batum all season. That was a big factor too. But that happens a, it, in the playoffs. Role players at home sometimes have those moments. Yes, yeah. That might, it, that might be the biggest contribution from anybody involved in that trade uh, during the <laughs> postseason. It, it might be. It was a huge game yeah. for Batum. He had the game winning block on Tyler Hero on the following possession after the Ubre um, layup and and one. I mean, he, he played great, but the Sixers had to survive that game. They had to get through that moment at home because you and I know the Sixers lose that game and they're going into the other side of the bracket with Boston, probably lose it in the first round. All the discussion for the next several days is how Philly choked again because all, everybody knew what was in front of them if they won that game, where they're probably slight favorites to beat the Knicks, but it's going to be an incredible series, probably the best series of the first round. Maybe the one McMahon's at better, but this one's going to have a ton of drama and expectation with it. And if you win that series, they're going to be favored to win the next one because the Bucs are a mess. And if the Bucs aren't even there because the Pacers beat them, they're going to be favored to beat the Pacers. So it's all sitting right there for Philly, but they had to get through that game. And the way it was playing out, as disastrous as the first half was, they're down double digits in the third quarter. You're, man, you're going, man, it's going to be another just awful night in South Philly. They're not going to get it done. And they found a way to fight through it and overcome it. And I thought that was a huge game for them from a psyche and an overall emotional standpoint to get through it. And I know there was all this talk about Joel looked banged up. Joel looked, he's, he's on the court and playing. He always says, if I'm out there, I can play. I'm good to go. Well, that's the standard I hold him to. So he was not great, especially offensively. The first three quarters of the game, he did play really well, I thought, defensively. There were times his conditioning didn't look great because he hadn't played much and he hadn't played in several days. But when it mattered in the final six minutes of the game, he stepped up and delivered. And these guys got a huge win. And I think it really sets them up for what's going to be an awesome series with the Knicks. Yeah, the um, the Knicks are obviously, uh, they have a lot going for them too. And um, they earned that number two seed. 
They sure had the gas down throughout the whole uh, stretch run, regardless of the challenges that they had. Um, they, 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 they earned it. And look, they're a, they're a good home team. That's a, the garden is going to be a great environment for those games. They get to play the first two games there. A lot of times the ability to start a series at home is maybe it's not as important as playing game seven, but starting a series at home makes a big difference. It's an undervalued, um, it's something that happens in the series in a series. So, um, I think it's that's undervalued to be the higher seed. Well, people always talk about you get game seven at home. Nobody ever talks about you get game one at home. I, well, I suppose that's true. <laughs> game one is important. Uh, you know, people, people overreact to it for sure. But like, you know, you get you get ahead too well. You're almost you're, you're almost impossible to beat, and it's you get a better chance of doing that as the home team than you do as the road team, obviously. True. Um, and I think the Garden will be great. The fans are totally into this team. They love Jalen Brunson. Um, it looks like the guys that they do have are healthy. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, uh, you know, the the Philly role players. I, that's going to be a, a big factor. Ubre is a high variance player. Um, I know that Max Harris got benched in the fourth yeah. quarter last night. He has struggled lately. Yes. Um, you know, you're, you're not going to get 20 from Batum every night. Um, but to me, the, how those Philly role players do, cause I know Maxi and Embiid are going to, are going to show up. You know, I know Brunson, uh, is going to show up. I know that, uh, the Knicks are going to play hard. I know Tom Thibodeau is going to have a short bench. Um, I know they're going to play rough inside. I know Hartenstein and, and Mitch Robinson are going to be rough and tumble inside with Embiid and probably lose some of those battles, but I know that they'll play hard. Um, there's more givens with some of the Knicks players than I, you know, you know, I, you know, DiVincenzo is going to take 10 or 12 threes a game and he's going to make some, you know, he's going to have those moments. Um, the Philly role players, I think, are the, one of the biggest variances uh, in that series. Uh, well, you, define show up for Embiid because – by his standards, the guy averages thirty. Like he he shows up for thirty. That's why I didn't think he played and, great because he scores and, thirty, and the, falling out of bed in the playoffs. Well, this whole season, he's had a lot. Well, okay, well, guess what? They're about to start the playoffs, and he has as much as anybody to prove in the playoffs because his career, and a lot of it's been out of his control due to injuries, but his career is full of playoff shortcomings, playoff disappointments. You know, I I would say the guy. A lot of those were injury related. Yes, I I mentioned that, I, but I would say the guy in this series that you have the most confidence is going to show up is Jalen Brunson. When he has been the man in a playoff situation, he has consistently been awesome. Going back to when he had forty one and thirty one, and probably made an extra twenty million dollars when Luca was recovering from the calf in the first round a, a couple of years ago. You know, obviously last year was phenomenal in the playoffs. You know, it. this is a really interesting matchup. You know, obviously Embiid's still playing his way into shape, which is nobody's fault. It's just the way it is coming off that meniscus. Um, it's obviously going to be an extremely physical series, but the Knicks are the slowest-paced team in the league. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, in in some ways, if it's, if it's Knicks now... I think Jalen... Led the league in dribbles this year, and I don't think it was close. Like I think the second yeah. spectrum data, he 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 was averaging like four hundred dribbles a game or something. Yeah, they are the slowest paced team in the league, and in some ways, I think you're better off seeing the Knicks now and the Pacers in the second round than if it was going to be the other way around. Just because I'm not sure that uh, Embiid is ready to put on track spikes uh, right now. <laughs> um, uh, Jackson, by the way, points out always thinking about college first that uh, Jalen Brunson has hung more banners in the Wells Fargo center than any other sixer, which the name, I mean, the sure, sixer bro. since <laughs> whatever, because it's Villanova's home arena. That's why he's saying that. Yes. Yeah. Bond Tim, to, to that point. Series. So is DiVincenzo and Josh Hart. As long as you're going oh, to, why stop? That's why true. stop with Brunson? All these guys are, are, uh, are accomplished there. The, the old Nova Knicks. I think assuming Joel Embiid stays healthy, which we're going to assume for this exercise, I'm going to pick the Sixers to win a very long and very close series for two reasons. One is he is the best player on the court, and in a toss-up series, I tend to defer to the best player winning. No disrespect to Jalen Brunson, who I had first team all NBA and had an incredible season. The other thing is what you pointed out about the pace. There's two things, I think, stylistically that really play into the Sixers' favor. One is the pace. Joel is not going to be in a track meet. 
which certainly is going to is always a benefit to him and especially is in this series. The other thing is the Knicks never play zone. They play basically man 100% of the time. Tom Thibodeau is going to do his thing and he's going to do it well in the play like that he's going to stick to what he does. That's mm-hmm. we know that's Tibbs mantra going way back. And Isaiah Hartenstein and Mitchell Robinson are both terrific centers and it's 48 minutes of great center play, but them going man to man basically with Joel Embiid, he should be able to control that matchup. And so I think at the end of the day, I do overall like the fact that they've got the this is going to probably be a rough and tumble kind of series. I think between Embiid and Maxi, without Julius Randle, I worry about the Knicks' ability to score enough in the playoffs. Um, and I I think the Knicks will, or I think the Sixers will squeak this one out, but. I will say this, whoever wins yeah, that's this gonna series. That's going to break the Knicks' heart, man. That's going to break well, the Knicks' look, heart. The Knicks have had a heck of a season, and I think they've got a – I certainly don't feel super confident in a pick in this series. I think the Knicks very easily could win. Whoever wins this series is going to be, to me, a pretty significant favorite to make it to the conference finals. And, like, everybody knows it coming in. So we'll see what happens. But I would, I would probably say Sixers and six or seven. Right. Now, I, I will point out that the Knicks are responsible for one of those eight losses in the 40 games that uh, Embiid played. And, you know, you don't take too much from one regular season game in early January. This was a period where Embiid was out for a little bit, came back for a couple games, was out for a little bit. But it was a 36-point arse whooping uh, by the Knicks that was in Philadelphia. Um, and you can, well, Julius Randle played in that game. He was one of 11. Julius was awful. He, yes, he, 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 he certainly he was, was not the 11. reason. He was yeah, not the was reason. Uh, Josh Hart came off the bench, was a plus 46 in that game. Oh, my um, God. Brunson. Yeah, they, they slaughtered Brunson the Knicks. They slaughtered the Celtics. Or the Celtics. I, I'm the Sixers. I'm losing my mind. They slaughtered the Sixers in that game. I clearly didn't get a lot of sleep last night. And uh, they um, they hit 18 threes. They, they blew the doors off. Of Philly, like they could absolutely win the series. I I don't feel super confident. At the end of the day, it's yeah. what you said before, McMahon. Like Philly had to get through this game to give themselves a path to the conference finals. It is sitting there for them to get through the next two rounds, finally break through. I know it's not getting to the to win in a championship, but we all can agree if Joel Embiid leads these guys to two playoff series victories and they get to the conference finals, whatever happens against Boston, sure. that's a breakthrough playoffs for him. So. They got through last night. It's all on their racket now to get through it. And on let's their see racket, if Joel a tennis, can do a it. tennis reference. That's rare well, on this pod. Good let's job. Let's see if Joel Embiid can I think do it. was it. a pickleball reference. Oh, maybe. Either one. I haven't heard those since the bubble. Um, hmm. Joel Embiid's obviously the best player in this series. Jalen Brunson's the player I believe in most in the playoff stage. Hmm. I don't disagree with that. Are you taking the Knicks? Taking the Knicks. In four. No, I'm just kidding. Not in four. <laughs> <laughs> but I am taking the Knicks. I will be I will be shocked if this is less than six. I would be too. I think it's gonna be a hell of a series. Sounds like a lot of miles on I-95 for uh for for uh Bon I'm doing that all year, so I might as well keep going. That's true. Uh all right. The other series in the East that all eyes are gonna be on, I think, is gonna be Pacers, Bucks, Giannis, um status uncertain, uh likely out for game one. Also, by the way, Dame Lillard missed a practice this week dealing with an adductor injury. He is back, I believe, practicing today, Thursday. Um, the thing about uh, the the core muscle area and uh, any any sort of any older guard, but this is an, these are injuries that uh, Lillard's issue had, deals, had issues with before. He had sports hernia yeah. surgery two years ago, if you remember. Um, that apparently contributed to why he played so poorly right at the end of the season, including that last game of the year in Orlando. They got crushed and he played terrible. Um, and look, I'm sh- maybe he'll be fine by Sunday, but as we talked about already this week, they need Lillard to be great in this series. And Lillard is now dealing, we now know with this issue. Um, and it's one of those, this is one of those injuries that can linger a little bit and affects movement. So that's just, that's important to recognize. Obviously this is, um, a high stakes. Here's a high stakes postseason for the bucks bond temps. Um, uh, I, I'm. I know they went four and one. A lot is different about this now. I'm. 
I'm not disregarding the four and one that the Pacers went against the Bucks, but there's a there's a lot going on here that wasn't the case back in January when they were playing all the time. Yeah, I mean, you could you you could argue the Bucks were playing much better the first half of the year. The schedule say. was a million times softer, and they were twenty nine well, against the rest here, of the league, and by the thirty way, and third and one and four quick. against the Pacers. And they had yes. a, a healthy two time MVP yes. under under Adrian Griffin. Uh, the Bucks were the second offensive team in the league, number two, number nineteen in defense. We were crushing them defensively. They were nineteenth. Yeah. Um, and overall net efficiency, they were ninth. So ninth is okay. It doesn't make anybody think you're going to breeze four, 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 but, uh, oh, fo, fo. since the coaching Another change, they're 18th, uh, in offense. So they've gone from two to 18 in offense defense. They've gone from 19 to 15 and the actual raw number difference is almost negligible. It's really, I mean, I guess it's improvement, but it's against a tougher schedule. I don't know how you qualify that and net efficiency ninth to 17th middle of the pack stuff. Um, and they've they only went from had a very soft. They went from a very soft schedule to a pretty hard schedule and they look like a worse team as a result. But to your point, a lot's different. Pascal Siakam into the, into the picture now for Indiana. A lot of stuff's changed rotation wise with Pacers. Buddy Hill's now obviously in Philly. Uh, Buddy Hill, by the way, playing in his first playoff game. Yes. Uh, on sat on uh, Saturday, uh, and, and it took him eighty six games to get there, as you wrote about Bon Temps. That's right. Played That's this. actually if pretty count, incredible. If you count the play in game and you count the in season tournament game, which both are like exist in the ether and don't actually count anywhere, um, he's played the third most games prior to the playoffs of any player in the history of the league. Yeah, Kobe um, White had a had forty two points in the Bulls win over the Hawks, who lost seven straight games in the season. Talk about limping into the night. Um, and he was informed after the game that his 42 points wouldn't count as, you know, for anything really. And he was like, well, I'm counting it as my career high. Thank you very much. Right. I support God that. Bless. Hey, God you know who also count it? Mac 10. Mac 10 has been lobbying hard to get those, those points added to various. He certainly, uh, there's totally certainly yeah, he declared LeBron the all-time scoring leader well before the rest of the world. Yes, right? that, was a, that was, that was some creative math, but <laughs> To go back to Bucks Pacers, sorry, Mac, to me uh, now Max Seven. I'm sorry, go on. <laughs> Max yes, Seven seed. Please, this please series, be honest. Please be fair. Sorry. This series comes down to me to two things if, in terms of how it's going to go. Setting aside the honest injury question, and they're both on the Indiana side. One is what version of Tyrese Halliburton are we going to see? Is he looked a little bit better towards the end of the regular season? Is this week off going to allow him to get back to the same kind of player he was? before he got hurt back in January. Because if that guy shows up, the one who was one of the probably the five best players in the league over the first two months of the season and was pushing this team at a ridiculous pace, I'm not sure Milwaukee can keep up with that. The other, to me, vital matchup in this series is Aaron Neesmith against Chris Middleton. If Aaron Neesmith can bottle up Chris Middleton and keep him from going off for 25 or so in these games, I don't see how the Bucs are going to keep up with the Pacers from a scoring perspective, especially if Giannis is less than 100%. We'll see what happens with Damian Lillard. He obviously looked terrible against Orlando. Indiana, not exactly Orlando at the defensive end of the court. So I think if Dame is out there, he should have some easier sledding. But they, the Pacers, we know we're going to score. We know they're going to push the pace. And they're you're probably going to have to get to a buck 15 or a buck 20 to beat them on a nightly basis. And if Neesmith can hold Middleton to 15 or so, you go start going down the list of guys. The Bucs run out of scoring pretty fast if they don't have Giannis out there. They don't have Giannis at 100%. And, like, I think the math in this series really favors Indiana, which is partly why they played so well against them in the regular season and why I think Indiana might win this series regardless of Giannis' status. Well, and, and while Giannis is out, Dame has to put on a cape. Yes. And we have, we have not seen that version of Dame – uh, other than you know a, a, a glimpse here, a glimpse there, since he's gone to Milwaukee. I mean, obviously, we've seen this guy, you know, score 40, 50 points um in, in playoff situations. They're gonna, I think they're gonna need that to be able to win games while Giannis is out. You know, I think the other fascinating matchup here is obviously you fire Adrian Griffin in, in midseason, you bring in Doc Rivers, championship experience, you know, all those kind of things. Uh, I, I think the Pacers have a coaching advantage here. And, you know, Doc obviously has had some some playoff meltdowns, you know, some 3-1 
meltdowns. Uh, and, and look, Rick Carlisle went a full decade after, uh, it's been longer than that now, after winning the championship in Dallas without getting out of the first round. Um, but I would say that Rick is as good, I think, as there is at the in-series, game-to-game type of adjustments. He never got out of the first round after that championship in Dallas. But that's because he like, he never had a team that was good enough. He, he squeezed the most out of those teams in those series. Um, so, look, the Doc Rivers hire to this point has been a massive failure. And something better change quickly. Well, you could say the same with the trade, too. They've had eight games with Doc where they've had Middleton, Giannis, and Dame together. And the one thing you'll say about the Pacers, you absolutely 100% know what their identity is. Their game plan is rough. I mean, it changed a little bit with Siakam, but their game plan is going to be the same in game one as it is in game seven, as it was in October. They're going to play fast. They're going to try to get the score up really high. The ball's going to move. They're going to throw the ball ahead. They have a they have a style of play. They may get beat at that style of play, but okay. I don't know if the Bucks have much of an identity, and they're not going to have Giannis at the start, and they're going to try to figure it out. And look, you can have a great identity if you don't have the you don't have the the execution. It's not going to matter. But in this situation, you know, the I think the Pacers have the advantage because they know exactly how they're going to play and they've been playing that way. Mm-hmm. And um, that kind of stuff matters in this. So to me, in all honesty, without knowing Giannis' status, I think if you're Milwaukee, you hope when you board the plane next week to fly down to Indy, you're 1-1. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think you're hoping 1-1. You're hoping to make the... You know, you're hoping this is a five game series with Giannis coming back. And that's without me knowing that it would be game three or anything. Maybe it's, he maybe can come back in game two. Yeah. But that's what you're hoping for, I think. You're you're hoping to to not have a hole to have Giannis dig you out of, you know, and, and then again, you don't even know how he's gonna look. Uh okay. Also in the East, uh, we're gonna leave well, the Celtics. On. Hold on, hold on. I'm Ooh. I'm I'm gonna take Indiana to win the series. What are you doing, McMahon? Indiana in six. Well, I mean, this is my big belief. My big belief is outside uh, the Nuggets and the Celtics, there are no upsets in this uh, in this first round in the league. I think anybody can beat anybody. I think seeding is irrelevant. That said, we got Bontemps picking the seven. But he won't and the make six. any predictions. But he won't make any predictions. Who are you though? picking? I'm actually saying that there is no that no predictions that 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 that. <laughs> <laughs> that, the, that, it's, that you can't even Stop, pick a favorite. Just move along. Saying. Just move along. Just move all right. Along. I'm just saying you picked That's the ridiculous. six and the seven. That's all I'm saying. I did. Yes. And you picked nothing. And I'm, I'm sure you're going to pick the it five the here in this series because we're talking about magic Cavs, Cavs of the four. Donovan Mitchell in an interview with cleveland.com. Actually, I, it might've been with the whole league. But anyway, Donovan Mitchell proclaimed himself 100% um, this week. I'm ready to go with my knee. I don't necessarily believe that that's true. He did have his best uh, game since his uh, went out with the injury right at the end uh, against um, I think it was against Memphis when they secured their um, their playoff situation. He had 33 points. It was the first game he'd over 30 since February. I'll take him at his word though. So if he says he's 100, percent I guess he is. Um, the Cavs are facing a series here where they're not playing their best basketball. They were I think 11 and 16 or something like that uh, down the last quarter of the way of the season. Not impressive. Their defense fell off. Their rebounding fell off. A lot of it was based upon Donovan's issues. The the Magic come in. This is a team has not played at all in in the playoffs. They were in the playoffs a couple years ago for a cup of coffee under Steve Clifford. Um, But their core guys, Franz Wagner, uh, Paolo Bancaro, Jalen Suggs, those guys haven't been in this setting before. Cleveland is a, a relatively good sized favorite for a four or five series by the sports books. Um, to me, I want to see right out of the gate. I want to see who Jamal Mosley starts um, right at the end of the season. He changed his starting lineup a little bit and put Jonathan Isaac in as a starter alongside uh, a Bancaro. Isaac, I think is a key player in this series because the Cavs big men are uh, an integral part of their offense and they run lobs. Basically that's like a huge part of their interior game is their guards driving in, attracting attention and throwing lobs to um, Mobley and Allen. 
And Isaac is one of the best pick and roll defender, big men mm-hmm. in the league. And it looks like, I wonder if Mosley is preparing to boost Isaac's minutes. So that's a strategic thing to watch early in the series. In addition to Donovan's um, uh, overall explosion and also whether the magic can score, they are the um, they're in 22nd in offense. They're the worst offense of the teams that are in the playoffs. Um, the Cavs in the regular season, when they had success, just flat out outscored them. And it was Sam Merrill. And believe it or not, like to watch the injury report, Sam Merrill's been dealing with the neck injury. Sam Merrill tortured the magic with the three point shot in the games that the Cavs won against in the regular season. Sam Merrill was like enemy number one of the biggest enemies against the magic this season. So believe it or not, <laughs> whether Sam Merrill can play and his three point shooting prowess to help the Cavs get the, the scoring up there could be a factor in the series. Cavs corner. Man. No, I Jalen Suggs defending Donovan Mitchell to me is going to be the key to this series. If you if you make Donovan Mitchell's life tough, you make this series ugly. If the Magic make it a, a mud wrestling series, the Magic will win. And Jalen Suggs, I, I we'll see if he ends up on a, on an all defensive team. He's that caliber of defender. He made my he made my all defensive team. Yeah, and, and mine and too. You, you mentioned Donovan is uh has not been right lately. Has not you know not been in a great groove. So uh, I, I think that's the matchup that's going to determine this series. Who are you picking? I'll probably go Magic and Six. I think there's a lot of not great mojo in Cleveland right now, and I think uh, I was inspired by your your Cavs Corner rant where you basically just took a flamethrower to Cavs Corner. And uh, – <laughs> I, I that convinced me that the uh, the basketball gods will not will not respond favorably to the uh, Cavs. We'll call them rotation decisions in the season finale. Well, I'm going to take Orlando also, just since Brian set it up that way anyway. But I I agree with you completely. I think if you go back to last year, the Cavs lost in the playoffs because they got punked by the Knicks. If the Magic win this series, it's because they're going to be able to punk the Cavs. Like that's what it comes yeah. down to. If the Cavs can, if the, you mentioned Sam Merrill, you're you're right, Brian. If the Cavs can get to 105 points in four games, they're probably going to advance. 95 like, might. Ser- in all honesty, 95 might do it. 95 might because the Magic are going to play like the 90s Knicks, and they like Jamal Mosley's done a phenomenal job. They are a tough physical team, and they grind teams down. That's what they did to Milwaukee in the regular season finale. We talked about it the other day. Milwaukee was trying to win that game. They just got absolutely bludgeoned by the Magic. Now, Jonathan Isaac started that game because Wendell Carter was having some back spasm issues. We'll see what that looks like in this series. But Magic, big, long physical. And if Donovan Mitchell is anything less than 100% and they can slow him down and get into Darius Garland, get into Jared Allen, get into Evan Mobley, I think Orlando can win the series. But you're probably going to know right away if game one goes like Orlando's able to set the tone physically and beat them up and win, it's it's probably going to be a good sign for them. Well, and you mentioned the Magic basically don't have any playoff experience. I mean, they've got like Joe Ingles and some guys on the roster who do, but their their core has none. Uh, I would say that the Cavs' cores, that their experience in last year's playoff uh, is a black cloud. Well, you're dancing like it's, around. It's, it's it's weighty on them. What I'll say, which is that the Cavs are the more talented team in my view, but I question their mental toughness after last year's playoffs. So, and I after not, Sunday, I mean, let's be honest. Well, that was not the I don't think that path to that take. was a that was an organizational decision. That wasn't by the players. Well, but I'm, I'm talking saying about the or, from an organizational well, standpoint. I'm they not have put, to prove it. I'm not putting that loss on the guys who were sitting on the bench. My point is they set themselves up where this is their season. Well, that's true. Um, I will say, you know, again, the Cavs have not won a playoff series without LeBron since the 90s. Uh, Since Dan Gilbert's been the owner of the Cavs, he's owned the team 10 years without LeBron. They have never won a playoff series in those 10 years, which is probably more relevant than talking about the 90s. Yeah. Because that's a factor for Dan. So... Keep that in mind if they don't make it out of this series. That you know, that the, as it goes forward, and, and Don, the- done everything but taking a billboard out saying, "Hey, if we can't get to the conference finals, <laughs> there might be some problems coming." 
then right. this is after Dan Gilbert's whole well, and that's really extension. worrisome because the team they would play in the second round most likely would be the Celtics if they win. So yes, as we've um, discussed. All right. Uh so let's go to the West. I want to start with Mavs Clippers. Um Ty Lu stopped just short of promising that Kawhi Leonard will be ready to go uh on Sunday when the series starts. The, Do we think Ty genuinely knows whether Kawhi's gonna play or not? <laughs> I I think they I think the word hopeful, I think, you know, you only used that word the other day. I think they're hopeful, but I don't think they 100% know. And yes, this I would happened, say the answer is no. They don't know if Kawhi's going to play or not. Before. And, and, and listen, sometimes they don't know from half to half. Listen, you remember last year with the whole thing where, like, it, it was dictated, like, sometimes the morning of an afternoon game to them. So, it's like, Ty. So, I'm sure it's a lot of angst in there. Uh, Harden is going to be ready to go. He missed the last four games with a foot injury. Um, you took a shot at him already there, uh, McMahon. Um, no, I didn't. You said the only guy in the, in the trade, uh, you were referring to Batum, the only guy in the no, trade. No, I said, I said that might be the most impactful postseason performance by anybody in the trade. Batum was awesome. It was just praise from Batum. Um, all right. How do you see this series, McMahon? This guy's got his, we got Mavs pom-poms out now. Here we go. Mavs, Mavs corner. Mavs pom-poms from the, from the guy who only says Mavs, positive things. Mavs um, look. Now, I told you guys, uh, a week or two ago that I thought the Mavs, well, I guess about a week ago, that I thought the Mavs would win the series. And look, let's just assume Kawhi is playing, right? Because if he's not playing, then it's pretty easy now. No, to... he's been out almost a month. A little okay, under a month. But, but let's assume that he's playing because if he's not, honestly, I don't think it's a very competitive series. Thanks. If he is, the Clippers clearly are going to have a chance because, you know, it We've seen this guy be the best player in, in many playoff series, including uh, the last couple of times that the Mavericks and Clippers played. Again, the game six that he had in Dallas when the Clippers were facing elimination, he had 42 points and guarded Luka down the stretch. I mean, it's one of maybe the best playoff performance I've ever seen uh, live. But you you do have to be a little bit careful about reacting too much to – the way a team's playing going into the playoffs. Um, having said all that, the Clippers have been in a in a funk for a little while, and the Mavericks have been playing as well as anybody in the West uh, for six weeks. And you know, I I don't believe in James Harden right now, I, and I don't think that's some kind of super controversial opinion. Obviously, he's got a checkered playoff history and. Uh, he just hadn't been playing well for a while. Whether he hasn't, it, he's had a really, a, really mundane second half. Bottom line, yeah, and and he's been awful defensively, and then just like ineffective offensively. Um, whereas Luke and Kyrie have been clicking, and then these, you know, these athletes around them, everything's fit. They're playing extremely well defensively. <clears throat> you know, one thing I'm really interested to see, uh, poor Vika Zubat. Uh, you know, he basically got played off the floor because Luca just kept hunting him in the previous series. Uh, so I'm curious to see how that works. And if the Clippers do go small, how do the Mavs respond? Because, you know, the, one of the Mavericks' strength, like Daniel Gafford has really been impactful, um, while Derek Lively the second has been out. He has returned to practice. Uh, also, the poor kid's dealing with the death of his mother, which I just cannot yeah. imagine. Um, but there, there's optimism that uh, that he'll be able to play in the series. So the Mavericks will have the option of their 48 minutes of you know tag team, you know big time lob threat uh, rim protector types. Um, they also have the option of playing small with with Maxi and kind of a switch everything. Uh, type of thing. So I'm curious to see how much the Mavs respond to uh, the matchups or how much they just say, hey, we're going to play the style we've been su extremely successful successful with for the last six weeks, and we don't think the Clippers can beat it. Yeah, I mean, this one to me is simple. I'm taking Dallas to win because I think Dallas might win in a series where I knew everyone's healthy, and I don't. I don't know if James Harden's healthy. I don't know if Kawhi Leonard's healthy. Dallas has played great lately. I think they match up well here. Luca, I think, is the best player in the series, um, especially because we don't know what Kawhi's status is. So I'm taking Dallas to win, and hopefully Kawhi's there and great, and it's an awesome series because it's got a chance to be a seven-game classic. But 
I can't take the Clippers right now when they can't even tell me that Kawhi's playing. Like, yeah, there was a time this year where Dallas. there was a time this year where I was trying to get my mind around the Clippers beating the Nuggets four out of seven because they looked so good and they had a lot going for them. And we are just so far from there. I mean, I guess that team's still in there. Um, the other thing is, I, I, you know, people have been talking this week, like, oh man, Luca's got this great history against the, again, you know, I mean, not obviously in the playoffs, he's lost from the playoffs, but like, you know, he's got these incredible individual statistics yeah. against the Clippers in his career. I'm like, guys, Luca's got great stats against everybody. <laughs> but but it is true, especially against the Clippers. And honestly, the the playoff numbers against the Clippers are unreal. Um, it, that they just weren't good enough to beat the Clippers the last couple of times. He was asked this week, hey, what's different between uh, this series and the previous two? And he, he had a three-word answer, we have Kai, uh, which there's a lot of things that are different, including the entire rest of the starting lineup outside of Luka. But obviously Kyrie Irving is the biggest difference. And, you know, again, the, the Jalen Brunson we see now versus – the Jalen Brunson that, that was in the uh, last time, the series, the last time they played the Clippers, he was a sixth man who Carlisle kind of pulled the plug on, which was a, I just praise Carlisle. That was an awful coaching decision. Um, where Whereas, you know, Kyrie is obviously a legitimate co-star that is clicking. Okay, so um, what game was it in 21 in Dallas where Kawhi, is that game six? That was game six, yeah. One of the great games of the last decades in the playoffs. Um, absolutely jaw-dropping performance. Uh, honestly, pro- if Kawhi's played a better game, I'm not sure I can remember the top of my head. Um, I don't know if that type of performance is possible, and they might need that type of performance. Um, and I think it's more likely that they get that type, that if there's going to be a player who does that in this series, it's more likely that it's going to be Luka. Yeah. Um, well, and the other thing, the thing that was so impressive about that performance is Kawhi was dominant offensively throughout the game and guarded Luka down the stretch. Um, I, it will be very interesting to see how much Kawhi takes on the Luka challenge defensively. Um, and and also just who's like who's the primary defender? Are there are they gonna go with Terrence Mann? There is a funny history between Luca and Terrence Mann. They're actually both Bill Duffy clients, but there is no love lost there. <laughs> There's been a whole lot of a whole lot of beef in there. Um, you know, are you going to ask Paul George to do that? Um, you know, I, I would assume that Paul George is going to have to guard either Luca or Kyrie. Yeah, you know, that, that has to you ask know, of that uh, of him. Kawhi and Paul George were really, really good at times this year. Really, really good. All mm-hmm. NBA good. Like. But they're going to be my all NBA teams. They're going to need, they're going to need that stuff against the way the Mavericks are playing. And I don't know if this defense down the stretch when they made the, the, um, the starting lineup change, obviously it wasn't just about Derek Jones jr. It was about an overall change of mentality. But if that is indeed the way they're going to defend McMahon, they're going to be tough to beat four times. Okay. What what are your picks before I move on? Mavs and six. Yeah. The Mavs and I'll take Mavs and six also. All right. Um, I always say in six when I'm picking the the underdog. Yeah, that's the if you're picking the underdog, it's assuming the they're going to win a home. Yeah. To take. Although there's yeah. been a number over the last decade, a number of Game Seven home losses, including um, it's true last year with the uh, Celtics dropping that mm-hmm. game to Miami, which was I still not over that. Well, also, including quite notably in this conversation when Luke outscored the 64 win Suns by oh, himself my, first exactly. half. Exactly. <laughs> that was speaking of the yeah. speaking of the Suns. All right. Uh, I'm, this is a series that I'm highly, highly interested in. Mm. Uh, Wolves, Suns. Um, the Suns have some optimism right now. Uh, they like the way they're playing. I think they finished nine and four, obviously won the last day of the season. Um, was it last day of the season? Or was it Friday? It was last, last day, day of the season. season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Last um, day of the season. And it was, uh, it was came back from blind to beat. I was just going to yeah. say it came down the fourth quarter. They beat Sacramento on Friday game that put them in a position to get out of the play with a win Sunday at Minnesota. Then they go to Minnesota. They beat Minnesota. They get the sixth seed. Now they get Minnesota again. Yeah. And it was a, it was a pre playoff game because there were huge stakes. Right. Yep. That game include like basically, Hey, if you don't want to see the Suns in the first round, beat them on your home floor. 
and it didn't happen and it wasn't close. Bradley Beal put together some really good games at the end of the season. Um, this is kind of the bait and switch. It's happened to the Suns on and off this year where they would get a little bit of momentum and then somebody would get hurt or they would lose their focus. The one thing I'd say about Phoenix is um, they can beat anybody or lose to anybody on any day. And so I would say this applies in the micro and the macro. So they're up by 17 going to the fourth. Obviously, they're, they've are they been a bad fourth quarter team. You ain't home. Let's say they get up. They get up 2-0 against Minnesota and going home. You think they got this series? You just better be careful. You, <laughs> you better don't know. be careful. <laughs> Yeah, this, not, not, this not, team not, is fragile. Not in this chapter of Suns history. Yeah, it can go all over the place. Uh, the other thing I'll say is the in the regular season games, they were very aggressive defensively against Ant Edwards. He only averaged like 18 points against them in the three games. No, he, did a, he averaged 14, and he shot was it 31%, really that low? He shot 31% from the field, and he shot 27% from three. So I suspect it's not going to quite look like that over the next seven games, yeah. but if it does, we'll see. So uh, right out of the gate, let's see what Chris Finch has cooked up. They've got a long time to to to, to really review that and what they're going to do to deal with that. Now, Cat uh, will be back. And uh, the big thing here, the reason I think that the, the Suns have had success against Ant is that they don't really respect the other Wolves' offensive threats. Mm -hmm. They're willing to triple down on him and gamble that the other Wolves players can't get it done. Now, Cat obviously being back, coming off the knee surgery, we'll see. But as we've talked about, about the Wolves throughout the season, their weakness is that their offense sometimes puts too much pressure on their defense. They, they, they need the defense to win them the games. Well, Booker, Durant, and Beal, there's going to be times where you play great defense, even with all the length that they have, and they just beat you. There's going to be times in this series where the Wolves are going to need some baskets. We'll see if they can get them enough to win. Well, and you hope, if you're a Timberwolves fan, that Cat was able to chip some rust off in the last couple of games of the regular season because he he wasn't efficient, wasn't great. Um, but, you know, got those games, you know, maybe that helps get his legs under him, has the whatever it is, week or so uh, of, of practice. They need Cat to be, and let's also be honest, talk about playoff histories, Cats ain't pretty. They need Cat to have the best playoff series of his career. Um, Ant was dealing with some kind of illness in this last one. Um, they, you know, Ant has to has to play at a star level. The Suns are a really tough matchup for the Wolves because they've got three of the best mid range players in the league, and maybe the two best mid range players in the league. And you know, the <clears throat> the Gobert has always been. Uh, a dominant drop player, drop coverage guy, dominant rim protector. He is much better than people want to think as far as a uh, a, a switch guy, an isolation guy. But it, you've always been able to – like the the one little weakness is that you can get those, uh, those mid-range shots, um, and the Suns are as good as anybody at exploiting that crack. Yeah, I mean, it's a tr it's obviously, for all the reasons you just said, it's a very tricky matchup for Minnesota. Um, on the other hand, the Suns don't have any size, and Minnesota is going to play big, and the Suns are going to have to deal with that. So, like, really, I think a lot of this comes down to which of these teams is going to be able to establish their identity on the series. Is it going to be Devin Booker and Bradley Beal and Kevin Durant living in the mid-range and hitting a ton of shots there? and just outscoring this Minnesota team? Or are the Wolves going to take advantage of the fact that Suns, I think mean, Yusuf Nurkic is not that good at this point. They have no size inside, and they can and sometimes Vogel just the pulls boards. Them. Sometimes Vogel just pulls them and well, he goes, be, you know, he, as he, he should a lot of the time. And Durant at center. You know, right. so they've had some stretches where they've gone that way, and it's worked. Well, it's not going to work in this series. Too. Well, maybe, because the other thing you want to do is try to pull Gobert away from the rim, and minimize his ability to impact games as a rim protector. Now, having said that, people are going to say, oh, boy, the Clippers played him off the floor uh, in that series when the Jazz was the number one overall seed. It's like, no, the problem was he won. Terrence Mann had the best shooting games of his life, but he couldn't contest in the corner and shut everything down at the rim when it was blow by after blow by after blow by. Right. <laughs> there was no Jaden McDaniels. There was no uh, Anthony Edwards. There was no yep. Alexander Walker. 
all three of those guys would be clearly the best uh, uh, perimeter defender on those Jazz teams. So, the you know, the Wolves, this is by far the best defensive supporting cast that Gobert's had around him. Um, but I still would have concerns if he's having a guard, and it might be his old buddy Royce O'Neal, who <laughs> was one of the guys getting blown by in that series. You know, if, if he's having a guard, a, a corner shooter, there, there's still concerns just because it is taken away the way that he most is able to impact games. Well, and the other thing too is the other thing too is like this is a big moment for Anthony Edwards. Like, let's see Anthony Edwards step up and be the best player on the court and win the series. Like, he's got the ability to do that, but is he? You know, let's see if he can. Well, because start with they're going to need him to play at that level to win. Let's start with individual games. You know, it's he might he's shown he can do plays to make individual games, and then that's what it might take. Okay, what are your picks? Suns and six. I'm going to go with Minnesota. I'm going to say Minnesota and seven. A higher seed. A higher First. seed, finally. I don't feel great about it. It's another toss-up series, but I, I like Minnesota to find a way to get it done because if for no other reason than Phoenix has been so inconsistent, I don't know if I trust them to pull this off, though it is for all the reasons we've laid out. Easily the best matchup of these elite teams in the West yeah. for them, for sure. Well, we'll see. Cat. The the variance that we may see from Cat could be really important because yeah. they just they yep. just may need the scoring. Um, also, the variance from Beal, who has been great and yes. average at times. Those are two players to keep a very close eye on early on. All right, seven versus the two Lakers versus Nuggets. Um, Stephen A has declared that if the Lakers win this series, that they could see could see them winning the championship. I the disrespect of the higher seeds in the Western Conference is. I, I would say I, the I, disrespect for the entire NBA outside of the Lakers, I would say I, generally. I, I found myself in a tete-a-tete on national television the other day with, with Shannon Sharp defending the honor of the Thunder, which was not my intention. I, I'm i not like, you know, super-duper pro-Thunder. Like, I'm not saying they're going to the finals or anything, but, you know, you can't out of one side of your mouth say that the Western Conference was one of the most competitive that that's ever been and that the Lakers at seven are, you know, are still a really good team. And on the other side of the mouth, say the team that won that that mid seed that whole season race to get the number one seed then are weak. You can't say both, and um, so but you can. It's just not correct. Well, whatever. I, I you know. But there are a lot of people who've watched the Thunder play four times <laughs> against the Lakers. Yes, <laughs> that's true. And the games um, against the Warriors. We'll put it up to like seven or eight. Yeah. So, um, look, I think the big thing here will be. The Lakers haven't beat them in, in like eight tries. Like it's like a year and a half. It's like December of 22, last time they beat them. Yeah, the big thing it, is, can the Lakers win a game? Well, exactly. to me, the Lake, can the Lakers get something done in the fourth quarter? Because these games last year, the Lakers were highly competitive all the way down, as you know. And Jokic and Murray and Porter and Gordon just took care of business in the fourth quarter. The Lakers are going to have to come up with some fourth quarter magic. And it's going to have to be AD and LeBron doing it. And they're going to need Russell to stay hot, and hit big shots. They got to come up with some fourth quarter magic and they're a great clutch team. And in my view, they got to figure out some way to go one and one. It's a classic underdog desire. Somehow go one and one over those first. They got to find a way to go anything in one. They got swept <laughs> last year. Let's just worry about right, man. one at any point. You might be right. Nuggets in four. I'm also saying nuggets in four. Love it. I love it. I most, have this rule. Most competitive never, sweep that we'll see this season. <laughs> That's right. You know, back when I did pick games, when I before I stood up and drew a line in the sand, say I'm not picking series. I used to never ever pick a sweep because I always believed that, you know, it would always go at least five. I always I tend to go six or seven, but Nuggets yeah. and four, maybe. Every series has gone. You've picked in six or seven so far, but you Denver. Um, well, yeah, because it's going to be an incredibly competitive playoffs. But Denver, uh. Denver also is, I think, going to be very highly motivated to uh, remind everyone of what happened last year. I'm sure Michael yeah, Malone has spent every day this week saying, hey, guys, you see this clip? Hey, guys, you see this thing? Hey, guys, you see this? Like they, they really relish showing everybody they're the best team. I have thought for a couple of months now they're going to get to the playoffs and turn it up several notches. They get this week off to get Jamal Murray feeling good. They have the altitude advantage at home. And again, if you watch this game on Tuesday, the Lakers-Pelicans game, the Lakers were wheezing to the finish line. 
against the Pelicans yeah. team that had Zion Williamson and basically nobody else. So Le- the idea LeBron's, that they're going to go in. We talked about the other night. LeBron's legs were, were dead at the end. Well, of the yeah. and the and, idea and, that and, they're going to go into this Denver series and take down Denver, or this is going to be even competitive, I, I I just don't see the argument. Like I said, let's start be. off to see if they can if they can somehow yes. get one one, and then we'll, well, and, we'll and, reevaluate from there. And they're having to they're having to grind their way to beat the Pelicans. And Joker had uh, all the nuggets over to his house and a drink. I think it's pronounced Rakia, some kind of Serbian liquor. I mean, so they're yeah. you know, they're, they're just. Max and then relax. Man has really gotten to know Eastern European alcohol in the last. So few I'm years pretty since. sure Luca wore a T-shirt last year, and I, I I can't tell you exactly what it said, but I think Rakia was on there, and I know it, it roughly translated. All I need is is meat and liquor <laughs> <laughs> and a basketball. And that that was when he had the that was when he was in a real funk, and he had that. This is the most frustrated I've ever been press conference and he was wearing that t-shirt which is pretty funny. that's that's a that's a hard uh life motto to uh or life ethos to argue with i yeah. gotta say all right we'll uh be talking to you throughout it uh some minor, minor schedule change um the the shows that are on espn2 are going to switch from running on tuesdays to wednesdays starting next week um but we will be talking to you before then everybody enjoy the beginning of the playoffs thank you to jackson thank you to mcmahon and bontemps thank you for listening and watching we'll talk to you next week Adios, amigos.